The Russian government says this sprawling compound an hour outside of Washington is a summer camp resort, but the U.S. State Department shut it down on Friday, accusing Russia of using the property to gather intelligence. A second Russian compound on Long Island, New York, has also been closed. And despite Russian government promises to retaliate against a White House order to also expel 35 of its diplomats, Russian President Vladimir Putin instead put out a tweet, inviting the children of U.S. diplomats to the Kremlin to enjoy New Year's festivities. In an official statement, he said, we will not create problems for American diplomats, we will not expel anyone, while adding he would be reserving the right to retaliatory measures. We will be planning our next steps in restoring the U.S.-Russian relations based on the policies pursued by the administration of President Donald Trump. With less than three weeks until he takes office, President-elect Donald Trump has responded. On Twitter, he applauded Putin's response to the Obama sanctions, writing, Great move on delay. I always knew he was very smart. But members of his own Republican Party feel differently. There are many sanctions we could take, financial institutions for one. They, believe it or not, the Russians have a very weak economy. We could uh, do a lot more damage there. Individuals could be sanctioned. Organizations should, could be sanctioned. When you attack a country, it's an act of war. And so we have to make sure that there is a price to pay. Now, Russia has cautioned the U.S. against adopting new anti-Moscow measures over allegations that the Kremlin sought to influence the November's race for the White House. I would like to add that it is necessary for the people in the White House to clearly understand that if Washington undertakes new hostile steps, it will get a response. It concerns any actions against Russian diplomatic missions in the U.S., which will immediately ricochet the American diplomats in Russia. Maybe Obama's administration doesn't care what will happen to the bilateral relations. Israel is now preparing itself for even more maneuvering at the United Nations against the Jewish state led by the Obama administration before ending its term in January. This as evidence of Israel's allegations that the White House actually helped to craft and push the UN's anti-settlement resolution forward may have just materialized. An Egyptian paper just published what it's claiming are the actual transcripts of meetings between U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and senior Palestinian negotiator Saeb Erekat earlier this month. If the documents are authenticated, they confirm Jerusalem's allegations that Washington and Ramallah were conspiring against Jerusalem. Kerry is said to have told Erekat that the White House would definitely back the Palestinians at the Security Council. One Israeli official says that as it appears in the Egyptian press, the protocol tallies with what they already knew, and that this is just the tip of the iceberg of U.S.-Palestinian collusion. Tonight, another angry intervention by President-elect Trump, this time over Middle East peace. On Twitter, he complained the U.S. was treating Israel with total disdain and disrespect, but told it to stay strong until the 20th of January, when he takes office. A speech by U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry brought on the row. He criticized Israel, accusing its government of undermining the chances of a peace agreement with the Palestinians. We have to be clear about what is happening in the West Bank. The Israeli Prime Minister publicly supports a two-state solution. But his current coalition is the most right-wing in Israeli history with an agenda driven by the most extreme elements. This was after last week's UN Security Council resolution calling for Israel to stop building Jewish homes on occupied Palestinian land. The US didn't use its veto power to protect Israel, as it usually does. And here in Israel, they're worried that in the very last days of the Obama administration, it could take another diplomatic stand, laying out the framework for a peace deal at an international conference. The Palestinians might welcome that but Israeli leaders would see it as another attempt to tie the hands of Donald Trump, who's promising them strong support. Secretary Kerry paid lip service to the unremitting campaign of terrorism that has been waged by the Palestinians against the Jewish state for nearly a century. What he did was to spend most of his speech blaming Israel for the lack of peace by passionately condemning a policy of enabling Jews 
to live in their historic homeland and in their eternal capital, Jerusalem. South Korea has described claims by its North Korean neighbor that it's close to testing long-range missiles capable of carrying nuclear warheads as being provocative. The announcement made by Kim Jong-un during his New Year address has angered Seoul. According to the North's leader, the intercontinental ballistic missiles are in their last stage of development. A South Korean government spokesman implied it amounted to warmongering. We perceive that the overall New Year's address made by Kim Jong-un yesterday did not offer any new visions. As for nuclear weapons-related comments, he showed again his determination to continue nuclear provocations by mentioning the completion phase of an intercontinental ballistic missile. Pyongyang, which continues to be under UN sanctions, has conducted two small nuclear tests in the past year, raising fears that it may have made significant nuclear advances, but it's never successfully test-fired such a missile. An armed attack on a uh, nightclub in the Turkish city of Istanbul has left at least 39 people, including 15 foreigners dead and nearly 70 others wounded. What the I got shot in the f***ing leg, man. These crazy people came and shooting everything. I don't know. I saw one person. They're shooting. I'm hiding. Around 1.15 a.m., a terrorist with a long-range weapon came to a nightclub. He killed a police officer waiting in front of the nightclub and then shot a citizen and went inside. He brutally and savagely carried out this incident by firing bullets on innocent people who were there solely to celebrate the new year and have fun. This is a terror attack. Jake Rake, an American, was one of around 60 people injured during a rampage in and around the Rhina nightclub early on New Year's Day. Rake was shot during the Istanbul nightclub rampage. He told NBC News he survived the ordeal by playing dead, remaining silent and motionless even after the gunman shot him. The 35-year-old from Greenville, Delaware, said that as the gunman moved through the club spraying bullets, he targeted people who were lying on the floor. He was shooting people that he had already shot. Police told NBC News the gunman fired some 120 rounds during his rampage in and around the nightclub at about 1.30 a.m. on Sunday. The incident lasted less than 10 minutes. They've got the appetites of typical teenagers, sharpened by not knowing where their next meal is coming from. These young men and women are from Eritrea or Somalia. They've been in Rome for 48 hours. Most of that time spent hanging around on the streets. Yusuf left Somalia a year ago with his best friend, but watched him fall lifeless off the back of a pickup truck, dying of thirst as they crossed the Sahara Desert. If we go, we say what is happening. He said, I'm not feeling well, and touched his throat. I gave him water, and he said he was fine. When we arrived three minutes later, he died. He was not breathing or making any movements. The city of Rome has no centers to look after these vulnerable people. It's left to small charities and private citizens to step in.
Thousands of people have protested in Hong Kong, demanding direct elections for the post of chief executive. All candidates for the vote in March currently have to be approved by an election committee, largely made up of pro-Beijing figures. The demonstrators also showed support for four pro-democracy lawmakers under threat of disqualification from a government-led judicial review. This protester says the four lawmakers who are facing disqualification, these people are elected by more than 100,000 voters, and yet the government's nonsensical actions have stripped the rights of Hong Kong residents. Riot police have clashed with protesters in northeastern Poland amid anti-foreigner sentiment after a young local man was stabbed to death after a row at a kebab restaurant. A Tunisian national who's said to have worked there as a cook has been charged with killing the 21-year-old. Amid the ensuing protests, the restaurant's windows were smashed and the police were attacked. 28 people were reportedly arrested. The chief of police in the German city of Cologne has dismissed claims of racial profiling after hundreds of North African men were detained during New Year festivities. The authorities wanted to prevent a repeat of last year's mass sexual assaults. The police have defended an overnight tweet which prompted strong criticism that people were detained based on their appearance alone. They say the word nafris is an internal term to describe young men from North Africa of criminal intent. Cologne's police chief said officers had orders to approach potential troublemakers. Three new cases of bird flu have been reported at poultry farms in western and southern Poland. The birds were immediately culled and an area of three square kilometers was sealed off around each farm. The H5N8 strain of avian flu is not considered harmful to humans but has been spreading across farms in Europe. France, Germany, Bulgaria and Greece are among the countries to have reported outbreaks in recent weeks. It's not easy to find orcas off Vancouver Island these days, but go far enough and there they are. These are some of just 83 of the magnificent marine mammals left in these waters. They're all related, part of female-led clans, as scientists call them, and their numbers have been shrinking. The southern resident killer whales that we've just seen specialized in eating fish, uh, primarily salmon, and primarily not just any type of salmon, but Chinook salmon. So the amount of Chinook salmon in the water and the size of the Chinook salmon that they can actually uh, hunt down, it is vital to them. Gone, just like that. That's also vital to local anglers who say they're catching fewer Chinook salmon than ever before. They blame destruction of freshwater spawning beds by the logging industry, coastal pollution and commercial overfishing. That's why they're proposing to raise and release millions of small salmon over the next decade to feed and encourage the orcas and eventually to have more fish that they can catch themselves. 30 kilometers off the coast of Belize, Lewis Godfrey prepares to check his lines. But instead of hooking fish, the 44-year-old is farming these shallow waters for something more lucrative, seaweed. Lewis's cooperative has planted more than 40 underwater plots with this wild variety of algae. It's one of the things these fishermen farmers are doing to save their marine environment from overfishing. Lobster went down, the conch went down, fish population went down a little bit. So now we're trying to turn, you know, alternative by planting seaweed and, and get stuff going. And hopefully it gives give the reef a break to, to revive and come back so we have stuff for the future. Floods caused by torrential rain in Bolivia have killed at least eight people. The National Weather Service has issued a high-level alert for heavy rain in five areas in the west of the country, including the administrative capital, La Paz. The downpour comes on the back of the country's worst drought in 25 years. Here in Cochabamba, the flooding stranded drivers and pedestrians alike. Even an ambulance had to be rescued from the rising waters. It's been described as a galactic gold rush, a race to mine asteroids. In the coming year, a number of companies will start testing technology they say will provide the resources needed to develop a permanent base in space. They're orbiting the sun right alongside the Earth with resources like water, with things like metals, iron, nickel, cobalt, that we can put in today's 3D metal printers, and we can construct structures in space. 
Private space companies Blue Origin and SpaceX are hoping for manned tests of their space capsules. And two space telescopes, including this one from NASA, which is designed to spot exoplanets, those orbiting distant stars, are due to launch in the coming year. Two, one. India's space agency plans to launch 83 small satellites in one go, something that's never been done before. And China has a mission to put a lander on the moon, gather samples and then bring them back to Earth. That would be a Chinese first. And after a 13-year mission, the Cassini space probe will descend into Saturn's atmosphere, sending back data to Earth until it's destroyed by the planet's violent icy clouds. Alexa, order trash liners. I found glad tall trash bags. Would you like to buy it? Yes. Artificial intelligence speech and language devices, such as this assistant from Amazon, are expected to become increasingly multilingual in the coming year, as what's called machine learning makes them more powerful. It's about developing a new kind of intelligence that will initially augment our human intelligence, but that machine intelligence will eventually solve problems which we as humans cannot solve. And some of those computers will be greener. Google says it will power its entire company, including its energy-hungry data centers with renewable energy by the end of the year. A new type of HIV vaccine will be trialed on 600 people in North America over the next year. It's already been shown to be safe, but now trials will test whether the vaccine is effective at preventing people from getting the virus. The car's doing it all itself. And despite the death of a driver in a Tesla electric car in May, while it was driving on autopilot, self-driving features in cars are expected to become increasingly common as many car and technology companies team up. The technology companies, the automakers, are really preparing, so they're building their business models around it because there's no question that it's coming. Many of these dizzying and disruptive advances in science and technology will provide solutions to some of the world's problems. But the greatest test must be whether they can and will improve the lives of us all.